Yes. <laughs> 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 So, why do it's a little different? It's a little louder, it's a little more like, uh, uh, <laughs> just preparing for that. So, because I don't want to be awkward. So, I like all you guys. You have very sweet faces. You all have kind eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I hate to rupture that relationship. <laughs> but I'm just letting you know, this is what's coming on. Alright, so right now in the city of Los Angeles, um, there are a lot of problems with police brutality. Um, I'm not sure what's like out here in San Francisco. I imagine it's not much different. Um, but recently, at an art walk, where people who were artists put their paintings and whatnot, um, there were these kids shocking in the street, being shot. And they were shot by the cops, the girls, and uh, beaten with batons and gas and all kinds of things. It was pretty brutal. In the city of Anaheim, um, which is in Orange County, but the whole thing's like on one thing in Um There was a gentleman who was shot in the back, Miguel Diaz was shot in the back, and then was handcuffed, and then shot in the back of the head. And uh, there was some protests over that, and uh, they released the dogs and the protesters. On families, children, all kinds of stuff like that. Um, so this poem's about that. It's also one of the first poems I was able to write when I was able to leave my job and become a kid this full time. And uh, the last experience I had in the workplace, the real workplace, the clock-in workplace, um, it was the worst job I ever had. Worst job I ever had. And I remember it was like during, like after the uh, after Black Friday, during the season. It was in retail, I was a retail manager. It's the worst job to have to do, I was assistant manager. Because everyone above you doesn't want to work. And everyone below you doesn't want to work. That's <laughs> <laughs> so I got yelled at high school kids. You pretend like you're working. <laughs> and then you yelled at by people that, you know, had degrees that didn't quite work out. <laughs> and that was my job. Um, but this woman was screaming at me, screaming at me. I was like, you know what, that's it, I quit. I quit. And she was like, I took my name badge and hand to her. And she said, no, you don't. Pin it back on my chest. And I was there for another six months. <laughs> Welcome to America. Anyway, <laughs> LA, anyways. Anyways, this poem was about that, but all this economic security is about dealing with all these problems that happen. Um, it's dedicated to Ellie's finest, and the name of the poem is Ellie is Full of Pigs. <laughs> Los Angeles, Point Park. In the streets. In the suburbs. In the wind. In a barely kept Hollywood bathroom, wheezing, vomiting, coughing of blood. These past few days, these past few years, I have spread myself across this sprawl. And now fear this drive. This drive will kill us all. And I wander over to General Hospital between whose walls desperation wears in high concentration upon the faces of the shop born prematurely ill life. As they wait upon the news of the illness they cannot afford to have, survival without insurance, this may take a while. Los Angeles is full of untold misery. A homeless man sleeps next to me, and I can smell the years of hard distance between who he is now and who he may have been. And all that stands for him in the bitter wind is chance, is the kindness of a night nurse who will let him sleep in peace. Los Angeles is full of good people who from time to time can turn a blind eye to killer policy, and I wonder how more bounce checks, free clinics, carry cash, and leave the count in the negative instead of me and him. Me and the bitter wind, and if so, where would I go? From Venice to San Francisco, there's not a war on the homeless, a war on the dispossessed. There are fewer and fewer options. They got shelters for women and children, all in that me. Just man up, homeboy, to that concrete pillow, to that cardboard blanket, and freeze your ass to death. Yes, the city will need to die on the same stretch of sidewalk where vents stretch into the sky. I wonder, as even now, Skid Row is being gentrified. As a city, as a system, as the pigs pursue past poverty, past hunger, past homelessness to the very edge of existence on Skid Row. Well, so far complexities of an economy are laid bare, where the rich are literally stacked up on the poor. Los Angeles is full of grotesque absurdity, especially on Skid Row, where there's a millions annually policing the misery of people with nowhere to go. So your pockets are empty, and you ain't got nothing, and change is just not coming. Well, there is no real difference 
between a booming metropolis and a barren desert and a world of money passes by you, passes through you, as though you were just part of the scenery protected in the knowledge that they are serviced by pigs who speak the language of violence, the language of the nightstick, the language of untold misery that will beat you for begging, beat you for sleeping, beat you for breathing, beat you for doing whatever it is you need to do to survive the night in the bitter wind, Los Angeles. I said Los Angeles is full of fucking pigs. This land is my land. This land is your land. From modern Mexico, all the way to Toronto, from El Salvador to the Jersey Shore. This land was made for you and me. This land is my land. This land is your land. From Guatemala to Los Angeles, California. No longer these kill us. Plant some evidence. Hold a press conference. And call it justice. Because we're not animals. No, we are people. We don't drop babies. We raise families. No one is illegal. There are no unborn criminals. Cause this land was made for you and me. You say this one was illegal. For womb. For pregnancy. For ovaries. Enemies of the state. For due day. A criminal conspiracy. A population explosion. An invasion. A birth canal. They say these things. Listening to the radio on NPR on the West, I heard a woman, a postnatal nurse, complained about having to serve the children of infants. They're overrunning our hospital, she claims. They're eating away at our economy. They're breathing in our money when born in incubators. She's not considered that maternity leave is a phrase quite unfamiliar to the, to the mothers of to the migrant women and their children, her eyes are not hers. Are ours are their anchors, they're aliens, they're un-American, they're something less than human. This is what seems to pass for debate these days. This is the tone of the so-called national conversation. This is the country you live in, where the voices of a vicious white nationalist and the same behind the Tea Party, the same behind the Minutemen, the same behind Arizona law are now targeting unborn children, governors, senators, congressmen, to think ride and create a wave, a tide of racial hatred are now talking about repealing the 14th Amendment. The one put in place to guarantee full citizenship to children of free slaves. The one passed in response to the Dred Scott case. This is the country you've always lived in. One of lies, compromises, backroom deals, reformist movements which promised little and delivered next to nothing. After all, it was the 14th Amendment that paved the way for modern day corporate world dominance. And besides all that, what followed reconstruction was Jim Crow and the sharecropping system. So spare me any talk of progress or protecting the Constitution or as professional politicians trying their hand at the amateur historian asking what the the framers' true intentions were. The framers owned slaves and stole land. They intended to keep them and steal more. They spoke openly about their adherence to doctrines of white supremacy, American exceptionalism, and manifest destiny. American history is a horror story. Relief really land grabs, captive nations, enslavement, mass incarceration, genocide, massacre, child labor, racial scapegoating, political rails, they the targeting of unborn children. This is the country you you have always lived in. It is the devil you have always known. And there is nothing synonymous with justice, its history, or constitution because the law is the land that was made master and slave. Robber Baron and child workers, they, beggars and billionaires, are worth the paper they are printed on. So they're bloodly, quite frankly, I don't give a damn who this monstrosity because it is criminal, because it is citizen, it's laws, it's amendments, or the Personally, I wouldn't wipe my ass with 
its documents, they might steam my bowels. <laughs> in Thailand, by some estimates, one out of 20 people work in the sex trade. A third of them are children. Boys and girls, the sons and daughters, former white farmers, former rice farmers, unable to compete against multinational such as cargo, sell themselves to foreign sex tourists just outside the cities of Pattaya, Bangkok, and Phuket. In the mid 80s, late 90s, town was referred to as a tiger economy, which meant only someone was making some money selling off the country. For most, Nothing changed though. People were, still, people were still starving, in fact, more so just in India, a country now supposedly emerging from centuries of colonialism into a major world economy. In India, there are over 125 million children forced to live there today. In India, children work, or they starve. Or they work, and they starve. In Peru, in Indonesia, throughout most of the world, they do the same. Today, one out of five children born in Africa will not reach the age of five. 35,000 children woke this morning will not see the end of the day. They will die. They will starve and they will die. In countries exporting food. In countries where civil wars rage, often fought by children. On principally by former colonial powers. For resources to be stripped principally by former colonial powers and process and repackage so well developing countries, once called colonies, often by children, the wealth and poverty of nations not fixed or found conditions mold by centuries of imperialism, centuries of colonialism, centuries of conquest, centuries of theft, centuries of slavery, centuries of capitalism that places profits over people, property over communities, paper money over the lives of children. What would you call a system that breeds poverty and yet punishes its own children with starvation, for the crime of being poor, for the crime of being born? What would you call such a system Capitalism is child abuse. Wow. Mostly I let my poetry speak for myself, but just speak for itself, but um so what we live in and say that should everyone your responsibility change it. It's my responsibility as well. Alright, this last one. This is uh, the story of my life. So, here it is. The history of my family has never taught to me. I climbed my family tree like Helen Keller. Depth that I'm blind. Piecing together what meant to Mexican, what it meant to be American. In a broken home under joint custody historically and still Mexican section of various Los Angeles. My father, raised by the bell buckle, raised by parents who go months without speaking, raised me under the influence of the bottle. Under his raised voice, under his raised fist, he raised a stuttering and shell shocked child. <coughs> Horrified and contentious. My mother, Raised with love, raised with encouragement, raised as the second born of the first generation, born in a new country, a beautiful and curious woman, raised me with a library card, raised a boy genius, had to raise his hand, had to raise his voice, had to raise questions in the historically and so Mexican section of British Los Angeles. I learned how to love. And I learned how to hate in the same place at the same time. But five, 
I quote Shakespeare. Roll the punches. Identify the instruments of orchestra and fall asleep to the sounds of gunshots. Pretend they were fireworks. To the sounds of my father's scream, pretended it was a television or the cup of blankets in the deepest, darkest, loneliest stretch of the night by flashlight. I learned how to read or pretend to be asleep to avoid life by five. I memorized the names and terms of all the presidents. It became something of an obsession when I grew something to someone just not sure who by eight. Thinking he would be proud of me, I told my father I could see myself in that oval office before he sat me down and said, son, we are Mexican. And this is America. That has never been happening. The history of my family has never talked to me. I climbed that family tree bitter and thorny. Her stories, my great grandfather died sick of the cholera of black when he got slaving away in the coal mines of America. Read a book about something called the Mexican Repatriation Act, and I began to piece together what brought him here, and then we'll send him back with a story from my grandfather and my grandmother was made that much clearer, and I began to understand their entire family had been deported from this country in the 1930s for no reason other than their last name and the color of their skin, and I began to piece together how I may never have been born, and that never happened, yes, I have spent the better part of my life understanding that oppression runs through my veins, and that is not history that goes down easy, so the boy genius who would be president now began to hate this country and all that it stood for, and all that it trampled over, the racism that are our mother's father and drove from its borders, the poverty and the misery that drove my father's father to become an alcoholic, that bitter legacy that never goes down easy, that drove my father and I to become alcoholics. Yes, I hated all of it. It's mindless consumption. It's mindless labor. The pointlessness of moving a box from one corner of the room to another. The misery of living paycheck to paycheck as a mindless slave to next month's rent in a heartless economy that drove me towards homelessness. And then when I lost that job, I shot through my days aimlessly, beaten down by the summer heat like a stray dog wandering the summer streets. And I remember my mother reading me Shakespeare. And I remembered all that I was supposed to be. Some kind of genius. Some kind of prodigy. But now I'm homeless. And I hated this country. And all that stood for. A government supposedly formed by the people that had never had anything to offer me but debt. With jobs that robbed all my time and energy of meaning and value and took and took and took until there was nothing left in this cruel joke of a meritocracy which now seemed poised, guiltless, and indifferent to lead me to my death. Yes, I hated all of it. But nowhere near as much as I hated myself. And I found myself drunk in the face, barely able to stand, barely still a man, and walking, talking, drunk in coma, sleepwalking through a childhood sanctuary. I found myself drunk. The library, applying for a card. But I came back the next day, and the next. And the next, and the next, and I read, and I read, and I read, and I began to see the true history of this country. The real nature of this economy was never taught to me. And it never been a question of peoples or borders or new world order. And it wasn't the white man. It wasn't my dad. And there was no personal failure, no global conspiracy, no Illuminati, but the very nature of the global economy, the very nature of private property. And I read, and I read, and I read, and I read Marx, I read Engels, I read Lenin. I began to agree with him. I saw for the first time that I wasn't alone, that it wasn't my fault, that I was a worker, that I was working class, that I was proletarian. And so very proud of it, a boy genius who dreamed of becoming president, but grew into a man much more likely to write his old congressman, demand his resignation, unless he could revive a country worth living in, one free of racism, one free of prisons, one free of the exploitation and oppression of women, one free from the social darkness. Free!
Heck yeah. The meaning of my life. The truth about the world and my place within it was never taught to me. Because there are some things you have to learn for yourself. Thank you guys.